Hi everyone, I'm Jody Barrows with The Square in a Square. Welcome to our live webinar today on April 4th of 2022. Now I have a lot of great little miniature quilts to show you today, I think about 35 of them, but we're going to have a little bit of teaching before we get into the quilts. So for those of you that are not familiar with Square in a Square, you'll know how we make these beautiful tiny quilts without any paper piecing. Now I don't know about you, but that's very exciting to me to think that I can just work with my fabric use the square and a square system and get these beautiful little quilts without having to sew or peel or purchase any paper to make those beautiful units. So, like I said, about 35 quilts we're going to show you and uh, some details about what actually makes a miniature quilt. But before we get into the teaching of the square and a square or the viewing of these great quilts, I just wanted to say that we had planned this little miniature trunk show for Sunday, April 3rd, and beyond our control, we worked for two hours with our technology, trying to get things up and rolling. Still not sure exactly what the bug was. We use a lot of different apps and programs interface with each other, and um, Steve, yes, it was internet. being the optimist that he is, he kept thinking he could get it going, and we just couldn't. So after two hours of trying, we canceled it and moved it to today. Now, normally on Mondays at 11 o'clock, we have our premium club um, classes, and so those classes have been shifted to um, Wednesday. Tuesday is a day that uh, we are busy with workers and shipping and sewing of samples, and we have a different schedule for Tuesday. So our regular Monday premium club border class will be on Wednesday, and you'll get your normal um, email on that with your papers that you print out and um, all of those things normally just push to Wednesday of this week. Now, um, any of you that are interested in our Premium Club, you can go right to our website and you can get information or email us and Steve will send you information. The Premium Club is a su subscription club. We have um, classes in what we call the fall semester and the spring semester and then some um, summer classes. and. People are really learning a lot, and this spring semester we've been working on borders, uh, learning the options in orders, looking at colors, knowing how to do sizes, and just all the ins and outs of putting beautiful pieced borders on your quilt, and learning how to let the fabric work for us, and to let the quilt talk to us to tell us what it needs. So the border class has been exciting and fun, and the students are really doing a great job. We have a separate Facebook page for our Premium Club members and they've been putting their quilts and their things that they've been working on on um, that um, private Facebook page and they are exquisite. They are really, really, really learning a lot and applying what they learn. So I highly encourage you, implore you to get some information about the Premium Club and join us. Now also, as um, Square and a Square has been around for close to 40 years now, we used to do a lot of shows. We're not doing the shows like we used to. We um, are staying home. We are working on our Premium Club classes and trunk shows like this that we do. And then also we have two big events each year. We have our spring retreat, which we are calling a Mother's Day retreat this year because it's May 4 to uh, May 8th. And we still have a couple of openings, so if you're interested in joining us for the retreat, um, go right to the website squareandsquare.com and you can get the information and sign up. Now, you will be getting classes each uh, morning, lectures at night, and lots of fun things during the day of little mini workshops, but you bring a Square and a Square project that you want to work on or something that you want help with, even a pattern that you want to adapt over. We're going to have uh, to the Square and a Square system. There's uh, myself and three other talented teachers with Square and a Square that will be there, so you'll have tons of instructions and someone there anytime that you need it, plus a lot of fun and um, a lot of learning with the Square and a Square. Then, the first week of October, we have what we call Quilt Club Week. This will be our third annual Quilt Club, so make sure you don't miss out on that. So, lots of fun and exciting things happening here with Square in a Square. Now, back in um, about 2017 or 18 or so on our Facebook page and with our Premium Club member, 
I started talking about learning the options and making what we call an option overview notebook. So if you're new to the Square and a Square system and what we're going to show you today, I highly recommend that you go in and make yourself a little workbook like this. So let's move our camera down and look at our square in a square workbook. You can even print the, the beautiful little cover off and start yourself a notebook. So with the option overviews, we start out learning the basic square, how to get the square in the middle, strips on the side, and to do this in a chain piecing fashion where you can make anywhere from 30 to 70 of these, 30 to 70 of these an hour. And this is the main construction of everything that we do. We call it the basic square. Then the different ways you use the ruler and of course the information in the book. You can keep going, sewing around it, trimming it with the tool, and each option is a different triangle unit. And then here you can see the famous option three flying geese. And we're going to be uh, showing you how to do the option one, the option three, and the option four, which is half square triangles, because these units are in almost every quilt that you make. And when you learn the square and a square system and how to break down the blocks and the quilts and the designs into these simple shapes, then, and you know that everything starts out just like this with a square in the middle and strips on the side, then it really helps build your confidence and increases your skill level and your knowledge and you become the piecer that you've always dreamed of. So um, there are actually 41 options now. Each option is a different triangle unit. This is option 12, the pineapple. And remember, you have one, one system and one tool that you use to make everything that you're going to do. And each uh, triangle unit has an option, and we just keep building, making all of these beautiful units. They're really simple and clean and nice and neat. Therefore, you get beautiful quilts, and it's easy to make them any size that you want to make. Now, looking down here at the table, you can see a basic square in what I'm going to call a large, a basic square in a medium, a basic square in a small. You can make these units any size that you want. And of course, the size of the center square is what determines the, the finished size that you'll be getting for option ones, option three flying geese, option four half square triangles. I mean, you can go just as tiny or as big as you want with these units. And you start out with a certain size of square, and that's what we call, uh, that's what's in the reference book. This is the Square in a Square reference book, volume one. We have one that talks about the diamond shapes, and that's volume two. But you're going to have your options, your first 17 options here, and then you have 12 pages of charts that help you when you're doing your own pattern adapting. And then you've got over 32 patterns in here. And the patterns are even broke down into multiple block sizes. So this one has one, two, three, four, five, six additional block sizes. So over 50 sizes of blocks. I always say that you can get to your sewing machine faster with the square to square system and with the patterns and the charts that help you with all of the sizing. So this is a basic tool, a basic book. If you don't have any of the books for the square to square, this is definitely one that you need. Now we have what we call the original square to square ruler, which we usually say that's the one that you need to start out with. And you can see it here in the package. And then this is a book that comes with it and it's the quick and easy book. It has five options. It has five options. 21 different block sizes and six patterns and you can make any size you want with this tool and there's a lot of different sizes in the book so you don't have to have just a special tool or a special book to make the miniatures we're going to be using today though our mini square in a square ruler because it is smaller in size and it's just a little bit more convenient to use when you're working with the smaller shapes but both of the rulers will make any size and they make all of the options that you need okay now inside this little book you've got four of the options seven patterns and four mini blocks so all of these have small blocks like we're showing. And as we get into the different quilts in the trunk show and we show you them, I'll try to refer to where you can find these great designs. Now, down here, uh, you, like I said, you can see the large, the medium, and the small. And most of the time I demo with this size just because it's a good size for everyone to see what's happening. But of course, you can go smaller. You can go as small as 
uh, well, just as small as is physically possible, which would be about an inch size. You're going to see some real tiny um, quilts today and sizes as we get into these quilts. So you can go just as small as possible or as large as possible. Now, like I said, we have a um, very speedy chain piecing method that we use to get these to get about 30 to 75 of those an hour. And once you get these made and pressed, then you're ready to trim them into any of the different units that you need for any of the blocks or designs that you're wanting. So to make the option one, when you see the, the finished or the completed unit, you see how we have a fourth of an inch seam allowance on all four sides. That's what makes it an option one. The way that you trim it is what determines where the points and the seam allowances are so that when you come in and sew a fourth of an inch or a fourth of an inch, all of your points are exactly where they need to be. So to make the option one, we wanna leave the fourth of an inch. So I have my little mini ruler here and I'm going to go to the 90 and I'm just going to push that 90 right into the corner of that fabric square. I want to check and make sure that my lines on the 90 go right over the seams on my fabric and that grid line goes right through the point. Now when you're first getting started uh, and you put your unit, uh, put your ruler here on your basic square, if it doesn't line up the way you want it to, then just turn it and choose a different corner. You have four corners, start with the best corner. It's like putting your best foot forward. Start with the best um, corner. Now, when you just look at your basic square, I always talk about the human element. The human element is the cutting and the sewing and the pressing, and that's what's gonna change your fabric and your units and your blocks and your work, is that human element. Was the cutting straight when you first got started? Was your sewing a nice seam, a scant seam? And then when you pressed it, did you use steamer starch that maybe distorted it? So this is the human element here. You have four sides to cut. That's four opportunities to get off, four to sew, and then of course two pressings. So you have 10 human elements just in the basic square. So start with the best one. Put your 90 right in the corner of that fabric square and there's your fourth of an inch, and we're gonna cut right there. That's really our only choice to cut, is that fabric that's hanging off from that 90. And just turn it, rotate it, and put the 90 in there again. But since now I've made a cut right here, I wanna make sure that my fabric square underneath is nice and neat and parallel with either my horizontal lines or my vertical lines as I get going and going around. So I put my 90 in, I check and see how it looks, and then I come out here now and check where I've already cut. If I have to make a choice to keep it square or to keep the lines where they're supposed to be, I have to choose this outside. I have to keep the outside square, even if these in here don't line up perfect, but you have to keep that seam allowance, that fourth of an inch coming off of that 90, you have to keep it on there. So the most important thing after you start cutting is your seam allowance correct and keeping it square. Now when you have all four sides completed, that is a completed option one. And of course, if you still have raw edges on your fabric, that's a cut size. If it's completely sewn into a project like you see this one here, then that is a sewn size. So it's important to know the difference in a cut size and a sewn size when you're using the charts or building and working on quilts of your own. Remember, you can type in a question anytime, and we have a text line that is 817-713-2879, and you can use that text number anytime that you want, and it's just like your messages on your smartphones. You can text, you can snap a picture and send it, and that's a great way for me to actually see your work so that your teacher can see what you're doing, and that way I can help you, and you can get to me really super fast with that text number, 817 713-2879. I love that. 
and being able to be a teacher that's right here at your fingertips anytime that you need. So if you, maybe you have a picture of a block that you want to make or one that you've seen maybe somewhere on some social media and you're like, is this block something that we can adapt to the square and a square system? Because anything that you can turn into the square and a square process is going to give you so much more speed and so much more accuracy than what than you've ever, ever, ever dreamed of. And it can turn complicated projects into really simple things. Just this past week, a lady sent me a block and she said, how would we do this square in a square? Well, it really was just simple uh, squares and rectangles with some triangle units on the corner. And it showed two blocks put together that you were gonna set them together side by side. And I said, are you going to put these two blocks side by side? Or are you gonna do sashing or something in between? She said, I'm gonna set them side by side. And I said, well, then I'm gonna go about them totally different than just looking at that block and making it. So sometimes the interaction of how these units come together in a block, or even how the blocks come together, um, help you decide how you wanna put this together. So it simply turned this quilt into a no triangle quilt into just squares and rectangles in the way that you're going to build them and put them together. So um, I love to do that and I love to help you and I love to help make your things more simple. So I think we have a question. I was just going to say if you're on Facebook we have a live uh, chat that you can participate in on YouTube and there's a link there. On so YouTube there's or a on link Facebook? On Facebook to okay. go to YouTube if you want to participate in, or you can keep watching on Facebook. Okay, you can keep watching on Facebook, or you can watch on YouTube. Now, the Facebook comments we have to get to later, right? Or do we right. see those uh -huh. now? So well, if you I see them, yeah, I can see them. Okay, all right. So we can see the comments from Facebook, and we can see the comments I just can't from respond. YouTube. Okay, we yeah. can see the comments. That's the kid, the key, but we cannot respond there on Facebook. So, so those will either come to later and answer or you can just um, or you'll talk to them as we go yeah or I can talk to it right here as we go in the video and not have to text it in okay all right so any questions nope. no everybody having fun and learning Yay. okay all right let's jump in over here and let's make some flying geese option three now when we look at the option three flying geese of course we start with our basic square strips on the side and we've used either a pattern or our charts to get our sizing so that our finished units turn out to be what we want them to be. And remember when you do the option one, you leave the fourth of an inch on all four corners. But when we make flying geese, we're gonna get two flying geese out of this basic square. So let's look at how it's trimmed. On two corners, fourth of an inch, fourth of an inch, two opposite corners. But on the corners that we're gonna cut through, we had to trim these corners different because we had to create a seam allowance in here where we didn't have one and we have to move our points because when we cut it in half, we're gonna come back and sew a fourth and a fourth and our point will be right there exactly where it needs to be. So we have to trim these corners different. We call it the two-step trim. And it looks like there's no seam allowance on there and there is not that fourth of an inch on there, but we've had to build it in over here inside the square. So let's look at how we do that. And let's do those two steps first. So take your 90 and push it into the corner, and then we're just going to step it over two lines. Here's one, two, and we're going to put the tip or the end of that line right into the tip or the end of that corner square. And you can use the left side of the 90 and jump it over two or the right. So here's my 90 in here. If I wanted to leave the fourth of an inch, there it is. Here's this line here, and I'm just going to pull it down one, two. So whether you go to the left or the right, there's no difference in it. And I have the tip of the line where it comes off and falls off the edge of the ruler right in the corner of that fabric square. My line goes down. I have a new grid line here from that point that goes in. And I'm going to make my cut. And that's going to be sharp right up to the tip. See how that's a sharp point. I'm going to flip it and do the opposite side. Now when all four corners are the same color, then you don't, it really, it doesn't really matter where you start. But if your colors are different and you're trying to get a location of a color on a certain side or wing tip, then you'll need to pay attention to that. And there's a lot of other great videos that we've done. You can go right to the website and join our, our webinars from 2021 and 2022. 
and there's some great ones in there. There's actually one in August um, that is called an overview, and there's also one in October that is a troubleshooting one that's a, two really great webinars I suggest you go back to. So you can see how we did the right up to the tip on two. I left the fourth of an inch on this one, and I'm going to leave the fourth of an inch on this one. So let's look at it before we cut it in half. Fourth of an inch, fourth of an inch. Two step, two step, meaning sharp trim. And I'm going to cut through that sharp trim. So I'm just laying my ruler through those sharp corners. I do use my lines to make sure the horizontal and vertical that my fabric underneath is staying nice and square. And I'm going to cut right through there. And there's my two perfect flying geese just like that. So if you were making uh, a traditional row of flying geese, there you go. If you're wanting to make a star, uh, actually I came up with the square and a square system and these flying geese just to make stars. I love these and um, they were a nightmare to make, but of course you'll put squares in the corner, square in the middle, and there's your great um, star. So what we learned on this one is we learned how to do the two-step. And when you make half square triangles, you want to do that two-step on all four corners. So let's look at this. So you can see how this was our square in the middle, just like our basic square. We trimmed right up to the tip on all four corners, just like we did on two of our flying geese, but we did it on all four. And then you cut and cut, and there's your half square triangles, just like that. So when you come back in and you sew a fourth and a fourth, your point will be right here, exactly where it needs to be on all of your corners and of course on your uh, flying geese. Does the bottom cut of the flying geese line up on the ruler? When you're cutting it in half, depending on the sizes that, um, depending on the size of your basic square and the size of your center square determines where these line up on the ruler. So it's, it's not that when you're coming in here and cutting it apart, it's not that these lines line up exactly with the fabric because these can be any size that you want them to be. And these are all half inch increments. Uh, but I do use them to make sure that I'm staying square. The main thing is that I'm going through the point and then I just want to double check to make sure I'm staying square. Because it's easy to see that they're parallel. Or... Yes, it's easy to see if your fabric edge and if your lines on your ruler, if they're nice and neat and parallel or do they look uneven, like you can see here. That's not good. You're, you're doing it to help keep that shape underneath there as, as parallel and neat as possible, okay? Which really isn't hard. It, um, it, I very seldom ever have trouble with that, and if I do, it's because my square, like a troubleshooting is, is that if your pieces don't look the way you want them to, if they're crooked or uh, wrong size, you always go back and the first thing you do is check your center square. You know, if your pattern said to cut it three and three eighths, did you really cut it three and three eighths, or did you cut it three and a half? Maybe you cut your strip three and three eighths, but when you came back in to cross cut it, you cut it three and, uh, three and a half or something, and so it's really not a square, it's a rectangle. Then the other thing is flip it over on the back, check your pressing, you can see here this one is a little, it's a great one to show of how not to do it because it's not pressed very well. But go back in and check your seams and make sure that they're all even because if this one's fat and this one's skinny, then even if this square was cut perfect, it's going to change um, the shape of that square and it's going to be, become a rectangle. So go back and check your human elements, the cutting of the square, the sewing of the seams, and of course your pressing to make sure that all of those are um, the best that they can be, okay? All right, now you saw these little pieces that we cut off when we trim our block up, and people are always uh, saying, well, what do you do with these, or this waste fabric? And we all know that our fabric has gone up um, in this pandemic, and it's gotten, it was already pretty pricey, but it's gotten even more so. So I saved my pieces. You can see this whole little basket here of pieces that I saved. This is kind of the average size. You can decide how small you want to save. And when you come back in to make your basic squares, it doesn't have to be a strip 
that you put on the side. It can be one of these little crazy uh, units that you've trimmed off. And as long as it's large enough to cover the square and wide enough, then you can go in and use it. This one right here, you can see how we um, had a scrap on it left over for something. And I'll just go in here and use the ruler and trim it up and I'll get my nice triangle unit. Like you can see here, I'll have that same triangle unit there. So your scraps are very easy to go back in and recycle them so that you can um, use up all of your fabrics and not have any waste. I always have a scrap quilt in process and this is one of them that I, that I have going. And um, so I can use my darks, I can use my lights, and um, we'll have a video on this scrap quilt later. Usually takes me about 18 months when I'm working on a scrap quilt because as I'm working on a project, I'll save those pieces and use them for my scraps, so it takes a while. Question, I sometimes have difficulty getting both of the geese units the same size. Okay, so her question is, is she's a square and square ruler uh, user, and she knows how to make her flying geese, and she said that she has a hard time getting these to be the same size. Well, you've got to go back to the troubleshooting, just like I said before, and you've got to go back in and check your center square, make sure it's really square, flip it over on the back, check those seams, make sure those seams. Most likely, it's probably going to be your seams. You maybe have got some wide ones, you maybe have got some skinny ones, and that's going to affect your outcome and your sizing. Um, you can take some, make some basic samples and uh, snap a couple of pictures of them and text them to me. I like to see the front of your work. I like to see the back of your work. It's great to take a ruler, lay it across so I can actually see. Or like on our little mini ruler here, it's got this great uh, corner square and you can lay it on there to where we can see what's happening in that text picture. So take a picture front and back, take a picture front and back and let me see what you're doing. And we can get, that's really a pretty simple problem to solve. We'll get that fixed uh, pretty quickly. Remember that text number is 817-713-2879, or you can send it to the email jody at squareinasquare.com if that's easier for you. Okay, another question. Uh, how do you calculate how much fabric you need when modifying a quilt pattern. How do you figure your fabrics when you're uh, looking at someone else's quilt pattern? Well, um, let's just, for example, let's look at, um, I don't know if I have any good samples over here in my, well, let's just look at this one here that I have hanging uh, behind me here. So let's say that you are looking at this pattern and you want to make it square and a square. So the only thing that's going to change in the pattern is where you're using square in a square. So log cabin, it's not going to change. Your borders here, not going to change. In any rectangles or plain squares in a block, they're not going to change. The only thing that's going to change is where you have your options. So whether it's option four half square triangles, whether it's option three flying geese, that's the only time it's going to change. And you're going to be making the basic square for those flying geese or those half square triangles. So when you look at the basic square, the square is going to be the same. It doesn't change. The only thing that changes are the strips that you sew around. So whatever your strips are, that's where your fabric's going to change. So even though you're looking at this quilt and you think, oh, 100% of it, I have to redo. No, you don't. The only thing you have to do is look for the options and find out what is going to be that, that triangle unit that's here in the strip. And that's the only thing that changes. And when you go to your reference book um, on page, there's, like I said, there's 12 pages of charts. So when you go to your reference book, um, on page 43 is your pattern adapting that actually teaches you how to take that pattern and adapt it over. And we do this in a lot of the, the webinars. You can go back into the 2021 webinars. And, and then also in our Premium Club, almost all of our Premium Club members can take any pattern and adapt it over to the Square and Square system. They're, they're so great. They're doing a great job. Here's, uh, in this one, it helps you 
um, know how to how much yardage you need, how many strips you need, how much yardage you need. And then right here, there's just one page on how to figure fabric for that. So the only thing you have to do is figure out what's going to be that strip, and that's the only fabric you have to change. So it's really pretty simple when you break it down and actually look at what you're doing and what you're going to need. And I'm here to help you anytime. So that's a great thing to uh, send me a text on or email. And then also, for any of you that are coming to the retreat center, bring a pattern and let's adapt it over to the square on a square system. We'll walk you through it and teach you how. And then we'll also go through and help you with the fabric. You maybe even already have a purchased kit and you're thinking, okay, do I have enough fabric in this kit to make my, my project? Once again, just go back and look and see where the surround strips are. That's the only fabric that you may have to make adjustments or changes in. Okay? Okay. All right. We good? Uh -huh. Okay. So now that you know the system. Which, uh, which book <coughs> were you showing? The book I was showing is, of course, the what I call the Bible. This is your square and square reference book right here. It's volume one. This is the one that we highly recommend. It does all of the options that start out with a square, and those are options one through 17. Then we also have the diamond book, and especially if you're, if we're shipping, you know, with shipping becoming an issue with pricing and everything with our gas, I always say get everything that you can afford all at once, so that way your shipping um, is as, as little as possible, and Steve is great at making sure that you're getting the best sh uh, shipping costs that you can get. But this is the volume two, and this is our diamonds reference book. So this one has the options that start out with a square, one through 17, and then this one has the options that actually start out with a diamond shape in the middle. So here you can just kind of see how we have this diamond shape in the middle with the strips on it instead of the square. And these are the options that are option 18 to um, 39. And then 40 and 41 are separate little patterns. Those are our newest options, and those are just in separate little leaflet patterns. Okay, more questions before we move on? I think we're good. Okay, so now that you know how to do the square and a square system and the three basic ones, and that everything comes from this, we're ready to go in and look at our um, little miniatures that we have. So, a miniature is a quilt that is 24 inches or less. It cannot be more than 24 inches to be classified as a miniature. It also can't be one big block. So, for example, I couldn't take um, this big block here and put two of them together and put a border on it and call it a miniature because the pieces inside are not miniature. The pieces inside have to be very small. So when we're looking at this one here, this is a eight inch block. So this one here is our eight inch block. Um, and so you could put four of them together with a little bit of sashing and a little bit of a border and you could have a miniature quilt. Now, when you look down here at the pieces inside, see how this square is a sewn inch. So these are small pieces. It's just like a bigger block. A miniature has to be just like the, the mother block, but just a baby, just down smaller. So anything that's like this inch sewn or smaller could be considered a miniature. Now I want you to look at how nice and clean and neat the block is. And when we teach, actually go in and teach, not just how to make the units, but how to put a block together, we show you how to do this so that your block just turns out nice and neat. This is not trimmed up or squared up after the units were put together. Uh, when we have large solid uh, units that are on the corners, like these or on the outside edge, we teach what we call overcutting and that allows you to help get all this together and have this nice, neat, clean, uh, organized, happy looking block. So inside here, you can see how we have, um, this is a, when you put four triangles together, that is our option 40. So here's our option 40 unit. This one is a flying goose. We just used a black and a black. This one is the option one. And then here we have some half square triangles, option four. And here is um, the plain 
square here. It's a cut one and a half, sews down to a one. This pattern is actually from our Transcontinental Railroad quilt that we did in 2019. There are a lot of eight inch blocks. I think there's about 10 eight inch blocks in that quilt. And this one is really a beautiful one, pretty to do. And you don't have to look at it and think, oh my, that's too small. Now, one of the things I love is that whether you're working with a tiny unit like this, or even like this, and this looks large compared to this little tiny one, because you're actually starting with four of these all at once, your square is a, a pretty decent size to work with, and your strips, so you're doing what I call the human element, the cutting, the sewing, the pressing, you're doing it in this larger size, and then when you get it trimmed up into your four units, they get smaller, and but you didn't have to sit there and work with these little tiny pieces of getting them together because you let the basic square and the system start it and do the work uh, for you. So when we come back here, you can see some of the, the pieces. So this one was for the, um, let me just take these out. So this is the size that you're working with, which isn't bad. That becomes your option one in the middle. And then this is the size that you're working with for these flying geese. So that's not bad at all. And here you can see some little color variation, how we had the black center, the black point, and then the, the black check. And here you can see how we had black on two opposite sides and the check. And so when you trim it up, then you're gonna have your, your corners where they're supposed to be. So see, these are not, not a bad size to be working with. And when you're working with it even a little bit bigger in the basic square form, it makes it much easier to work with and make these miniatures. Okay, so let's uh, one more thing about miniatures that I think is important to remember and to know is, is that you can go small. You can go tiny, tiny, tiny with these. But let's think about this. If you have a square and it's a one inch cut. When you sew a fourth of an inch and a fourth of an inch and a fourth of an inch and a fourth of an inch, this one inch here comes down a fourth here and a fourth here. So that means this is going to be a half of an inch inside. So when these fold under, when you press, when you fold that, that seam, you know, when you think about it, this was a one and a half inch here. If it was a one inch, these seams would be totally touching underneath there. So when this was folded back, this one would be to here. This one would fold to here. This one would fold to here. So you would have literally as much or more fabric on the back inside that one inch square than you do on top. So it's kind of like having um, three layers. You have your pieced top, which is total fabric. You will have the seams behind it, which is another layer of total fabric. You have your batting, and then you have your back. So it's like you have an extra layer of fabric in there. So I made, um, I should have had it for the, the webinar today, but it's, it's a king size quilt, but it's made with three inch stars. So that quilt is very heavy because it's got that layer inside there of seams, okay? So just to think about that, there's more seams on the back. So when you think about that, let's look at this down here one more time. It's really difficult to go down, to, to cut a square one inch, sew your fourth of an inch everywhere. You really can't go smaller than a one inch cut with um, a miniature. So when we're looking at this little um, half square triangle, it is a one inch half square triangle. So when it sews down a fourth of an inch everywhere, it's going to be even smaller than this. This is a three fourths cut half square triangle. So you really can't go, go any smaller than a three fourths of an inch cut half square triangle. And when this all gets pressed, it's gonna overlap on the back and you're literally gonna have more fabric on the back than you do on the front. Now, if you are making something that is this tiny, of course you go ahead and sew your fourth of an inch seam, but when you get these put together, you can go back in 
and trim some of that seam out or away if you want. And if it's a miniature that's smaller than 24 inches, then that's not a huge project, but just something to think about. Questions before we move on? I think we're ready to look at the quilts. Okay. Okay. All right, let's head over to this camera. This one is, um, could fall into a category of an Amish quilt because it's all solids. And this one is one that is called Sunshine and Shadow because it gives you the brighter color of the sunshine and the darker um, of the shadow. And in the Amish stories of when they look at a quilt or make a quilt, they talk about how that you have some sunshine in your life and then at times you have some darkness in your life and that you, you learn to work with both of those. Now these first couple of quilts I'm gonna show you about the first eight, these quilts were all made back in the 70s and 80s, and of course everything was hand quilted at that time, and so all of these, the, these first top ones here I'm gonna show you are hand quilted. Now when you work with a small quilt or a miniature quilt, you also want to think about your batting and what you're going to put in it because you don't want this thick little hot pad looking quilt. You want it to look like a real quilt. A true miniature quilt is supposed to look like a real quilt, but everything has been changed or adapted for its smallness and size. So even that batting inside needs to be thinner than uh, what you would put in a regular quilt because you don't want it all puffed up like this and then it's tiny You know 24 inches or smaller and it looks like a hot pad. So think about that when you're working on it now I'm not a um, I loved when I first started quilting. I loved the pieces and I loved the hand quilting um, Of course now I don't have time to do a lot of hand quilting and as I've gotten older My hands aren't quite as nimble as they used to be but you'll notice how I quilted through the um, center of that little uh, stripe. And you don't have a little Omni ruler, you really need one. Okay, so this was a one inch strip here, and it sews down to a half an inch. And um, I just quilted tiny little stitches in black right through the center. And then I really did an echo one. These are every, I'm not sure how well you can see it, but I did a fourth of an inch away from the seam triangle. I went in and did another fourth of an inch and another fourth of an inch. It's really very heavily quilted. I'm not sure if I changed the, if you can see it. It just really doesn't show up on the black or even on the back, which is kind of a shame. I now think that if you're hand quilting, you want to make sure that it shows up, um, especially on the back of a quilt. This is thinner, so it's, it's a great uh, quilt. Now this one, uh, once again, I think these top 10 are ones that were made um, pre-square and a square and um, all hand quilted. This one you can see the hand quilting on the back. And you can see the half square triangles. I would do this as an option uh, 14. So with these um, um, options that I didn't show today, like this one could be an option 14. You can see here how I started out with my square in the middle. I two-stepped all four corners, so that means when I go back and sew these on, it gives this blunted area here, which is good. That's what you want. And then I sew around it again. I trim it up. And when I come in to cut these apart, I'm going to get four of these, which is my option 14. So this little blunted area here becomes my seam allowance here. That's what's so cool about the system is it knows exactly what you need to do. So by taking my square and sewing around it three times, I'm going to get four of these shapes and each shape has one, two, three, four, five triangle units in it. So if I turn this like this and I look at this little basket, see here's two triangles, two triangles, and then the two on the side and then the bigger one at the bottom. So I would put this together as an option 14 and then some half square triangles along the outside edge and here on the on the corner. This I think actually was a block that was in, I have two here um, that I'm gonna show you that I think were blocks in um, a Quilt Guild um, 
gift exchange type thing. This one here I definitely know um, is, this is just a fan and um, I set it together, uh, the fan, so that you can see how it's kind of on point. And so for those of you that are new to quilting, on point means that when the block, uh, the point is at the top and you sew the rows together at an angle like this, so you're sewing the rows together and then you have a setting triangle um, along the sides and in the corner. And this one, once again, hand quilted. And it looks like just a little scrappy border on it here. And then it has the, the quilting on the back here where you can see. And you'll notice the little labels on several of these. This one was a gift. It's just a primitive little quilt, but look how you can use your flying geese for your star and your flying geese here for your heart. A couple of little embroideries and this one is an option too so we took our, our square in the middle had the blue strips on and trimmed it up leaving the fourth then we put around it again leave the fourth and there's your option too just a great little gift that I got a little primitive quilt and then this one was from a long time ago um, um, Maybe uh, some, uh, maybe just when strip piecing was coming in, maybe in the uh, early 80s, mid, maybe late 80s when strip piecing, but it's a little Santa Claus. So these are all miniatures because they're very small. Now these next two are just one block miniatures, but because the, the units are smaller, you can, uh, let's pull that camera out a little bit. We're getting bigger here. So this is just one little applique wreath, once again, all hand quilted. Uh, why would you make a miniature quilt? Why, the question is, why would you make a miniature quilt? Um, I guess the first thing would be just that you want to. The other one would be that you've got little pieces that you want to use up. Maybe you're working on a small project uh, during the summer while you're at baseball games with kids or something and you're uh, you want a smaller project to take with you. Um, I use all of these as display in my home. I think the miniature quilts are just really fun and cute. I've got a bunch here in this little basket that sets on one of my shelves. And um, I, I think it just comes down to desire that that's what people want to do. If you want to hang them on the wall, they're a smaller size is, is great. Okay. And of course, doll quilts, um, you know, just any of those reasons. Okay. okay. Now this one here has a little 3D effect of just a little folded uh, point in here inside the tulip, which is kind of cute and all hand quilted. And hand quilted little hearts on there. Can I see those or? Um, maybe you can see them here along I'll, this I'll one. I'll go up as close as I can. You can maybe yeah, move, I'll move it. Move it. Yeah, so there you can see those little hand quilted hearts. And that is on this piece right here. So you can't really see them on this side, but on the back you can see that it's a border with little hand quilted hearts. This one we used, um, instead of having a solid back for the applique, had a log cabin that came together. I love a log cabin because you can do a lot with colors. So this is one log cabin, two sides were light, two sides were color, and then when you made your four blocks, they came together. This I think was actually for a Hoffman challenge um, back maybe in the late 80s, early 90s. These um, log cabin strips were one inch, so they sew down to a half. And once again, all hand appliqued and hand quilted. Some really great little stitching on that one. Stash busters for sure. Stash busters for sure, yeah. Now, sometimes people would say, when I first started doing a square and a square, and I would get my little pieces that I trimmed off, I saved them and I made what they now call little mug rugs. And so I probably, I don't and I've given them for gifts, but I would save every little piece and put them together. So these are um, about half inch squares. So these were one inch pieces put together and a border and hand quilted, no less, for a mug rug. 
Once again, this one was all just scraps put together. They are one inch squares, so these were maybe leftover strips from one and a half inch pieces. Notice how on three sides the border is green and on one side the border is blue. True little scrap quilt. And this one is machine quilted, just kind of a stipple. So this one is a great little nine patch. It is put on point once again, so the block um, has the point at the top. And of course you sew them like this. At your uh, sew your rows together so that they will be at an angle on your quilt. And then this one is kind of unique in using the little nine patches in the corner for a great little accessory um, unit. And this one's machine quilted. This one is called All Spruced Up and it is an option one. So it is your very basic, um, you're going to start out with your basic square. You're going to trim it into an option one, which means a fourth of an inch on all four corners. And of course we started with a smaller size of basic square. And let's look here. So see how they're all sewn together in rows. So here you can see how this one had a light center and the green on all four sides. So once again, we're talking about the basic square, light center, and green on all four sides. Then this one had the green center, green center with red on all four sides. So the colors changed on your basic square, but you're just going to sew them together in rows. Now notice here on the end, our square in the center was light. We had light on two sides and the red on the other two. So it makes the tree stop and the background start. So all of these rows are just option ones, all put together. Three and pattern. get, yes, this one is, uh, this little small miniature one like this is in the mini ruler, the, the book that comes with the mini ruler. A larger version of this one is a free pattern that's on our website. Also notice down here at the bottom, these tiny, tiny, these tiny, tiny flying geese that actually make the bows on the packages. This one is a fourth of an inch by a half of an inch sewn for this little flying goose. So I don't know that you can really go much smaller than that. There it is. And then this one is a great one where I just went back in and used up scraps like those little pieces we cut off today. And it's folded up in that little basket. And it's hand quilted. Look at that. And it's got a thinner batting in it. And I want you to look at these flying geese just made from scraps, sewn, and then sewn in rows and put a little um, sashing on it. These are about one inch by a half an inch sewn. And these make great little gifts. Sometimes you want to make a gift for someone, you can make them a miniature. This one's definitely made from our scraps. It's a primitive star. You can see the flying geese. Um, like I put the star together earlier, your squares in the corner, your square in the center. And then I love to take a block and do what I call log cabin it, log cabin it. So you're going to make your block and then you just sew around it like a log cabin. So there's was a strip, a strip, a strip, a strip, whether you do opposites or whether you just continue around and then set them together. So this one was a, a star. I think it's a three inch star. Yep. And then we just did what we call log cabinet, meaning you sew a strip around each side. And there you go. Two borders. And this one is basically the same, but the star is a little bit smaller and um, the borders are a little bit wide. Sometimes I like that on a little one, putting a wide border on it. These are, this is a great um, little table mat. I have this one on a little table with a lamp. Um, and then also um, these are, I have some little shelves with little dowel rods on them and you can just kind of fold the quilts over like that and then hang it on your, your little shelf. 
and then I also have some um, uh, baskets and things like that that I put my quilts in. Question? No, just observation for me with our borders class. I would make that solid in the middle and your star around the edge. Okay, so, so you can put Steve, in the middle. Steve, thinking about our border classes where we're trying to show different ideas, you say put something different here in the middle? Even if it's just solid, because you're going to put a, a vase or a... Oh, okay, so if you're going to use this as a table mat, Steve says to make this solid in the middle so that your vase or your lamp or whatever you're putting on it on the table, and then use these little stars around on the outside. We've even talked about how you could put like uh, put three stars uh, in the corners and nothing in between. That would be really cute too. Great ideas, even from our. Would you make me one? Our, I don't know how to sew. Our <laughs> IT uh, technical people. Um, now these next two quilts are flying geese that have an extra little point in them, and I'm not going to go into detail today of how we do this, but it's really easy and it's really cool and it's really fun. To have a flying goose with an extra point in oh, the middle here. Far. Yeah, that's all right. Keep you can. Urch. Are zooming, <laughs> so you can see this one is hand quilted. It's got some really great hand quilted. It's been used. It's got a little stain on it here and there on a table, but um, scrappy but organized. Your stars are organized in colors, but it's scrappy because they're all different. And this is a great setting where you take a block and you do a solid setting next to it. And then you make the block and a solid setting and so on. And then this border here is what they call a piano key border. So let's zoom out. And you can see how it's just um, a strip that is long with a little square on the end. And when you sew them together, you have the color on one end, color on the other, color on one, and you just flip it. And this is called a piano key border. So a great way to go in and use up your scraps. And this particular one is not in any of the books or patterns right now that you can get. This is a very old one from a very old book. My very first book, if you have a, my very first book I did, oh, over 30 years ago, it was a blue book, and it was just called Square and a Square. It's in that particular book. But now, back in the beginning when I started, I only had seven options. So we made this quilt with just the, what we had available at the first seven options. Now we have 41 options, so you have more choices in how you would put this quilt together. So now, with all those new additional choices from what I had, back almost 40 years ago, I would now put it together differently than the way that pattern in that book shows to make it easier. And this is the same little block, just two of them put together. Once again, a little mug rug. I have, I don't know if it's a pet peeve or whatever you want to call it, but of course my kitchen has hard granite cabinet tops. Um, my floors are tile. Everything is hard. I don't like my my cup or my teapot or whatever when I set it on my cabinet in the kitchen. I don't want to hear the clank of my teapot on the clank of that granite cabinet. So I have um, a couple of little rectangle quilts like this that I have at my little, I'm a hot tea drinker and I have a little tea station and so I have a little, a little miniature like this right there that my teapot sits on. Also, it doesn't always have little water drops on my cabinet that I feel like I need to be wiping off. So that's just kind of a fetish or a pet peeve or a quirk about me is I'm, I'm big about cabinets being clean and nothing on them, no crumbs or water or anything. And I don't like glass hitting glass. So some, you asked me one use that I have, I have some regular 12 inch blocks that were orphan blocks that I made and turned into just a little 12 inch or whatever. And in my cabinet where I have, um, you're gonna think I'm really crazy. If you came to my house, you would find quilts in my refrigerator, in my pot holder drawer, and then in where I store, like I have a glass baking dish that's like nine by 13 and I have them in all the different sizes. I have a little quilt in between those because I don't like my glass hitting on glass. Inside my refrigerator, you open up the door, every shelf has a quilt on it. 
and and when something spills or whatever I just pull that quilt out it soaks up the pickle juice or the barbecue sauce or whatever I pop it in the washing machine and I don't have to scrub down my cap my fridge I don't get a little hard place of ketchup or whatever that's <laughs> on a thing I just pull the quilt out and wash it and it's ready to go so some uses for a quilt a little miniature one that you probably didn't think about right there so call me crazy but and if I have all these quilts, I have to figure out something to do with them, right? <laughs> so there they go. Okay, this one is a great one. This one is um, in the book I showed earlier, the main book, the Square and a Square Reference Book, Block 1. And these are, um, these are about 5-inch stars. These half-square triangles are about 1 inch. We used option four, and there's four of them in a row, and then the rows put together. A great way to use up your scraps. And then it, uh, when you have the darks in the corner, it kind of gives you this little circle motion of the star and just adds an extra, a extra pizzazz without you really having to do any work to get it. Okay, this one I skipped over. This one we used, um, this one is called Rounding the Square, and I think it's in the mini book. So when we look at a row, we put a lot of things together in rows and not blocks because they're easier to do. So here you can see a flying goose. You have a four patch, an option one, a four patch, option one, four patch, and then a flying goose on the end. And so these are one inch uh, option ones. These were one inch squares that are now half inch. And then in the next row, we just had... Um, a two patch, a plain square, a four patch, a plain square, a four patch, a plain square, and then to make that outside edge. And then in the very corner, we did half square triangles to keep that roundness going. That is a half inch sewn half square triangle, option four. Paper piece. Paper piece, no. Everything's the no, no paper piecing. Everything starts out square in the middle, strips on the side. And you can make them any size you want. This is a great one, Briley uh, Star. And it's just half square triangles. Um, I think they're probably one inch. Yep. Yeah. And this is in, I'm thinking this is in the mini ruler book also. It kind of gives you that stretch star look. And I think that's really pretty cool. This one's really soft. It's got a, a different batting in it that's better for miniatures that, you know, it, it, it's great for the size. Okay, let's zoom out on this one. This one's a tall one. This one's a, you can hang it over a little bar or hang it on the wall. This was from a book that we had that had a lot of uh, basket quilts in it. You can see the star here and the flying geese. I love this scrappy row of flying geese. A pinwheel from your half square triangles. This one we put a, this is actually option five. We did a nine patch to go in the middle. So option five is put anything in the middle. So here's the nine patch. Then the blue with the strips that went around. See, every time you have a strip, you get a triangle there. So this is an option five, and then these are option ones. So option ones, option threes here and here, option four, option five. So this was a great little quilt to show how you can start mixing the options together. And then um, just your baskets. Um, I think the basket, I, there is a basket collector quilt on the website that is a free pattern, but I think it's a different one from this. Oh, okay. It's out of that same book that's out of print, uh -huh. but it's a different, um, different okay. quilt. Yeah. This one is option nine. Option nine is one of our advanced um, options. And let me see if I can show you an option nine. I thought I might have one yeah. here. Um, I don't have an option nine. I thought I did. Okay, so let's look at what an option nine is. Okay, so here is your star, just like this. And an option nine is this right here. So you can see that it's a triangle shape. It has two triangles here. It has a flying goose section here. And then... A big big triangle nose there and so if you put two of them together you get this and then you repeat that 
put two of them together. So you can make a star like this really, really simple and easy to do. This is the option nine and we call it instant star. And um, we've just did some um, sashing and some corner squares, border, really cute. This goes on one of my little tables. This is some Christmas prints. So this goes on one of my tables at Christmas, one of my side tables. This fabric we've been using in our uh, border class um, this semester, this spring semester, and this fabric came from 1995, and we've had some people find some of it on the website. So here's another use for it for those of you, I mean, not on our website, just out in the web world. This one is really, really pretty. It's just a top. It's made from the half square triangles of option four, and then this corner shape here. This is Ocean Wave. And in our black book, Square and a Square, the main reference book, this quilt comes in multiple sizes of blocks, so you can make it small like this for a miniature or make it big if you're wanting it to fit a bed. But to make this the Square and a Square way, you have two um, blocks. So you have this one here, which is just half square triangles, four in a row and four rows. And so you can see it here. And then we have another block I'm going to show you. And then this one repeats here. And then here's the other block. And then here's your option four block. And so on. So you, those just sew together like that. Then the other block we have is this one right here. And here you can see our square in the middle. And then you see the corner units that have more dark in them. And then you see the corner units that have more light in them. So this corner unit is an option 14. So you can see this triangle shape and this triangle shape here. That's the option 10. And the cool thing is, is I get all four of these out of one square and a square block. And um, you're going to sew around it multiple times. You're going to have your, so like this one is your center. And then the red is this one, the next one. And then this one right here would be the next here. You don't have this uh, additional row on it for a 14. And you get four of these out of your block, and you'll just sew those on the corner, and there's your ocean wave. So, you know, normally you would look at a quilt like this in this small size or in the larger size, and you would say, that's a beautiful quilt, but I'm not making all those triangle units. But with the square and a square system, it just bumps you up that quilting ladder of success. It allows you to make all of these shapes and you can make them any size that you want. And let's just flip this one, one over on the back for a minute. I think it's always fun to look at the back of the quilt. Now, when you have small pieces or you have a lot of pieces, then we press them open. And that just really helps with that bulk, especially on the block with all of the half square triangles. Those are pressed open. But the back of your quilts, you know, don't have to look crazy. They can be neat also. Normally the back of your quilts look crazy because you've got these ears from these triangle units coming off. Your triangle unit wasn't a good one to start with and you just forced it in there when you sewed it. Um, and therefore the back of your quilts look um, unkept. But with the square and square system, it really helps to alleviate all of that. This one is called Rolling Star. It's not a pattern that's available right now. I had it years ago. If you have the, um, I think it's the anniversary book. I think it's in there. And it's really a cool block and very, very simple to do. You can see this little trellis or lattice work that runs through the quilt. We have, um, I think, two stars from each color. And, and then they're just kind of sewn in random. But let's look at one block. Can we draw this out a little bit so we can see this corner better, please? Uh, you want to, don't want to come in tight. Um, okay, I'll move it so that you can see the block better. Okay. You might be able to hear our neighborhood rooster. We've got one rooster called Cornbread, one called Old Red, and then a big white one. That's trouble. <laughs> okay. So here is the block, and this is just a simple nine patch block. So what that means is you have one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And when you look at it, that's an option 11 right there. 
and you're going to get all four of those that you need to go in each corner of the quilt from one basic square sewing around it two times so this was our center we sew around it the first time to get those and the second time to get those and then you can see here the option one and we used color on two sides and this trellis color on the other two Well, I'm just going to draw it out real quick, just so that they can see how easy it is to do this. So these are the patches of a basic um, nine patch type block and you can do anything in these squares you want and you can make them any size you want so let's say if we did all of these three inches three six nine that means this is going to be a nine inch block and all of these are obviously a three inch sewn they would be a three and a half cut you've got to learn your differences in your sewn and your cuts and when to use them that's key for any quilt making whether you're doing it on your own, you're using other people's patterns, or you're doing square in a square. So inside these blocks, you can put anything that you want. You can make them a four patch. You can make them flying geese. You get the idea how you can put anything you want in these blocks. So to do this one that we're working on today, We're going to do an option 11 okay and that's what these corners are and then we're going to do an option one another option 11 in the corner <clears throat> another option one just a plain old square of color in the center See how these option ones are what I call in the middle of that row. Okay, so there's my units. I know those are option um, 11s here. I know these are option one. So if we want to make this a nine inch sewn, meaning a nine and a half cut, we have to work with the sewn numbers, and we know that each one of these units here are a three inch sewn, no matter what they are. So that means this would be a three and a half cut. Notice how I use a C or an S by my numbers, so I know exactly what I'm working with. And so let's just look at our option one. So option ones are here, and we want that to be a three inch sewn. So let's go to page 34 in your book. And in this column here, it has your option ones, and it says, what is the sewn size you're looking for? Well, the sewn size of my option one is the three inch. So I'm just gonna drag my finger down here, and I find the three, and then the next column tells me what size my center square is, and the next one tells me what size my strips are. And of course, you've gotta look at the top to see if they're talking about cut or sewn. So, um, This is a two and five eighths cut, and those are one and five eighths. Um, I'm probably gonna bump it up to one and three fourths unless I'm working with scraps or whatever. So there's my option ones. I know this is gonna be a three and a half cut. It's just a plain square. This is my option 11. Now to use my option 11 chart, it says, uh, when you're reading about it, it says it shows you this little X and it says, what is the size of, of the X? So what is the size of that? Well, if that's a three inch sewn, this is half, which is one and a half. So I'm gonna find the one and a half on my chart and it's gonna tell me that this is a four inch, whoops, yeah, four inch. And my first row of strips are two and a fourth. 
and my last row of strips are three and a fourth. So that's how easy it is to use your book, break down a block, and uh, make what you're looking for. Questions before we move on? And I love how that makes that trellis through the, the project. This one is option 12, the pineapple. And you just start with your square in the middle, go around the first time it's an option one, go around again and trim it up. That time you've got good triangles again. But when you get to this third row of going around, that's where you start getting eight sides instead of the four sides. Now the key thing about, a, uh, about option 12 uh, the pineapple is is that whatever size of strips you start with on that first one every time you sew around it the strips stay the same size see when we're talking about sewing strips around it on these other ones and when you saw me just adapt that pattern the strips get wider every time you sew around these are wider this is the third row it's wider than the second row the second row is wider than the first row but when you're doing a pineapple, all of the rows stay the same size. And there's your pineapple, just like that. There's, if you go back to September of 19, um, you can find some um, videos that we did on the pineapple. Some beautiful, beautiful quilts. This one is um, just two colors, and it's an option 17. Um, I'm not going to go into detail with the option 17, but this right here... Where you see a bigger triangle with two little triangles that is the option 17 so you just put four of them together and you have this little twisting star here really pretty very simple even with just two colors now we're going to get into some of our diamond shapes so just like we had the square with um, strips on the side you're going to have a diamond with strips on the side and these are options um, these are particular ones here are option sevens and then we go from option 18 to option 39 all using the diamond shape so and with your ruler you're going to use the 60s here and here on your ruler like we use the 90 for the square you're going to use the 60s and the 120s same ruler. same ruler one ruler makes everything i love it that one ruler and one system one ruler cuts all of your shapes and it makes all of your different units. You don't have, a, have to have a different ruler for flying goose and a different ruler for half square triangles or a different ruler for the diamonds. The one ruler trims all of those up and it makes them any size. So you can make a little tiny miniature with it or you can make uh, the larger quilts with them. So this is the option seven right here. This is how it all works uh, with this, the diamond in the middle. Strips on the side. <clears throat> trim it up and what you're going to get is this option seven shape right here so you can see how the diamond is horizontal here in the block and you can see the colors from the strips on those points so we did not make this quilt by making little stars and sewing them together we did this one in rows so you can see how we have this one and look how black is on two ends orange on the other and the plain square, option seven laying down horizontal, and see how those just repeat. And then in the next row, we have them standing up. We have a bigger square, and those repeat, and then the rows just alternate through the quilt, and there you go. And this one is actually in the first book. Um, I always like to put in the back of the book some future stuff so that you can see, oh, there's more to learn. And this one has this cute, this one's called Midnight the Pumpkin Patch, I think. And we've got this cute little pumpkin here on the corners. This one is the um, same as the black one I showed, but we didn't do the, um, you can see the diamond laying down with a small square standing up. Same quilt, just different colors, different fabrics. And then instead of doing the applique on it, we fussy cut this fabric with the little stars that went all the way around in really, really a cute little border. And then this one is a storm at sea, which is really cool because most people think 
<clears throat> no matter what size you're making, that you have to paper piece a storm at sea. But you do not with the system. So here you can see that diamond laying down with an option one, and those repeat. And then in the next row, you see the diamond standing up. And this one is what we call an option two. You're square in the middle of the first row of strips, trim it up, put your second row of strips on. So an option two, an option seven, option two, option seven, and so on. And then look at this great pieced border uh, where we have the option sevens in those, like you see here. And um, great also quilt um, teachings on the Storm at Sea is available. And I love how the, the, um, um, the wave, the Storm at Sea, you can see the, the waves and the depth of the quilt. This one was just one quilt where I tried to put a lot of the different options in. There's not a pattern for it. Um, I wanted to have one quilt where I could show the different units. So here you have the option ones in this little um, nine patch block here. Here you have the option twos where you just keep sewing around. This one has one, two, three times that we put around. Here is the option three little flying geese here. Option four, half square triangles. We showed the um, diamond of the stars and then put anything in the middle. So just a cute little quilt that had lots of different options in it. Now these next ones here are option 39. And the option 39 is, um, it's not hard, but there's a lot of different steps. You do five different steps before you ever get your unit. So you're used to having a basic square and you trim it up and you have an option one, or then you cut it in half and you have flying geese. So that's like one step. Well, there's more steps that go with it to actually get uh, what we call the trumpet block. So this, this shape right here is the trumpet block. It kind of looks like a necktie. It's a square with this wedge trumpet shape in there. So on this quilt, we put four together. I'm sorry, we put uh, two together with two plain squares. Kind of could look like a little bit like a, um, a bow tie or like a Christmas ornament or whatever. And then this became our square in the middle. We put these strips on the side. So you can just really use your imagination and take your units and do so much with them. So instead of having a plain square in the middle, we did two trumpets, two plain squares, then we just put any color around the side to actually make our block. And then the blocks um, went together with an option two. So plain, here's your option two. <clears throat> And that made that quilt really a pretty one. This one I've had folded up somewhere. I need to leave it out and use it somewhere. I really like that. And then here is the same trumpet shape. We just um, we put the four to unit together just like we did before, but then we did a setting and a bold corner star. And actually the blocks coming together make this cool little star right here. And I love the, um, the trumpet block going up, going down, going up, going down for this border. Uh, this is one that we'll get to in our border class um, and show again, but really a, a pretty, pretty border with the blue. And the last one here is also um, the trumpet shape. So we did our star with our flying geese, option three. That's our square in the middle. So let's look at that. That's our center. And this is a cute little table runner here. So here is just our little star that we make so many times with our flying geese, plain corners, and a plain center. And then we added bigger flying geese here on the outside edge. And of course did that on all four sides and then in the corner we used the trumpet in the corner which is option 39. We set this one together with a plain square so once again your salt and pepper if this is on your your um, eating table napkins or salt and pepper or uh, vase or whatever here 
then you can see your pretty little stars and it actually has that little corner and I love this little flange on here um, this is uh, nice in the, the border and our shortcut binding tool does that. There's a video on our website. You get this uh, flange and the binding on the quilt all at the same time and it's super easy. And we're going to uh, work on that at our quilt retreat again. And there's some videos out there on the website and some other places that you can see. A shortcut binding tool and you can order those right um, from us. Then in the quilt behind me, this quilt has multiple sizes of blocks. It's a pretty large quilt, but uh, these are all five and six inch blocks. And because they weren't all the same size, notice how there's a down up to them. So you don't really notice that the blocks are different sizes, but it helps them all. It makes them pleasing to the eye and blends them all together in that row. And um, we've got flying geese in here, half square triangles. Option one, flying geese, half square triangles. And then this has the option 14 in the middle. This is really a cool one. And then down here on this one, you can see that option 11 in the corners like we had on the one that I drew out. And then we just went around it again and, and make that cute, um, cute one. And then, and these are all like five and six inch. And then let's see if we can get this down without the whole thing falling. Okay, good. <laughs> it worked <laughs> you never know okay these are small blocks these are like four inch blocks and then we just used a four patch with them and those go in the corner then you can see big 16 inch blocks so this quilt showed how to take multiple sizes of blocks and put them together and this was from a book it was kind of a green book and it was called block sampler you might be able to find it somewhere hiding out on the internet block sampler and it was a green book some of these older books are on uh, different um, internet sites and they're, they're pretty pricey, some of them are. But you know, if you're looking for one or a certain pattern, check with us because you may, we may have it in just an individual pattern or somewhere to where you don't have to pay $189 for one of those out of print books. So be sure and check with us. When it was 16 dollars When it was sorry. maybe 16 or $22 to begin with, yeah. So we've got a couple here in this little basket. Let's look at them. And then if you have any questions, get those in because we're fixing to wrap this miniature trunk show up. So this one is a cute little quilt and it's just, um, just some of those scraps that I used and put together to use them up. Look at the binding, how the binding is different scraps. So I used to, when I would make a quilt, I used to, um, uh, make the quilt, take the scraps, make another quilt, take those scraps, make another quilt. And sometimes I would have three to five quilts made out of the same fabrics, but I just kept processing those scraps until I got down to not having anything left from a little mug rug all the way up to the big, the bigger quilt. So it helped me keep my scraps under control. And you know, this was like 40 years ago and, um, I just I just kept using all of those down now this one was a gift to me it's really a special special quilt um, and it is little option 14s it's hand quilted it's uh, made by one of my um, certified instructors and just a really sweet little quilt so this is an option 14 that's basically one inch sewn and uh, when you look and so that means that these are a half inch um, little half square triangle and this is actually an option 14 so um, you would start out with whatever this white center is um, right here and that would be your center and then where that little red triangle is that would be where these are and then your next row of white would be where this little star is and then your bigger one here would be in here and you're going to get four units one two three four units out of one square because um, I don't know how if you can see this one is bigger obviously than this sample and this sample is larger than this one but um, let me use my papers that might be the best way for you to see so we're going to cut through these corners so we're going to cut like that and we're going to cut like that and then of course this is cut there you can see it popping out. So there you can see that option 14, which is all half square triangles. 
and you're going to get four out of this block. And of course, you can do um, different colors every time you put this would always be the light and this second row would always be the light but these in here that are color you can change those colors up and just make sure that this one matches this one and then those match right there but really a super cute uh, little quilt and really you can't go any smaller than that for an option 14. Um, and i don't know i've ever showed that one in a webinar this is a Storm at Sea again, but it's just a little bit smaller of a version. So you see I had scraps left over. I just went and made another one. This is not pieced. Back in the 70s, I did a lot of needlepoint back before my eyes and my hands left. It's 1989, says right here. So this is just a little um, cross stitch, and then I just put borders on it, and there you go. This one is in, um, this one's called Flower Gazing, and um, I'm not sure if it's in the... Is it the miniature? Or um, it's the either miniature. in the ruler book or the... Um, mini? It might be in the mini. Yeah, it is. It's in the mini ruler book. That's where it is. So, this one is just a row of option ones. So here you can see your option ones, your square and square with half square triangles and they make this little zip here. And then your next row is just half square triangles. Look at that. Look at how these are just half square triangles with a plain square, just boom. And then when you start putting those rows together, you have your piece. Now this little last border right here is really interesting. Notice how it has the blunted edge on here. Normally, if you were going to do um, flying geese remember how we two-step these um, remember how we two-step these corners so that you get a nice sharp corner like you see here in your uh, normal flying goose but in this one we to get this blunted edge here we took an option one so see it has that fourth of an inch on all four corners we cut it in half and of course we get two flying geese, but we don't have this sharp corner, we have this blunted edge. So when you come in here and sew them together, boom, 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 you get this blunted edge here. So it gives it more of a ribbon turn effect and gives it a different look to have these blunted edges on here. Just a different look. Okay, last quilt. Get your questions in, drum roll here. If you have any last minute questions, get these in. So, I went to an auction and there was this little bag inside a little box. The box wasn't any bigger than this square. And there was all of these little fabric pieces in this box and then inside that box were just a few little miscellaneous sewing notions. Some you know, it was like she had it all bundled up to sew on it, and she never got it done. So, part of the, there was a couple of little melon shapes put together that when I took it out and started looking at it, I realized it was, let me show, can we get, can they see all of it? Or does that mess you up? There we go. Okay, so there were a few of the little melon shapes that gave me enough clue that I realized this was a wedding ring. So I hand pieced the wedding ring, did it by hand. There wasn't that many, and I thought that was cool. Put them together. I don't know if she intended on making a bigger quilt, or maybe this was a little girl that was just working on scraps. I don't know. Um, but I went in and hand quilted it with the same little melon shapes and finished it just like that. You notice this one. Um, and this one here, this was maybe like the outside edge of the quilt. And it has the little sharper points on it when these in here, where maybe there was supposed to be another row or something, uh, because it doesn't have the little sharp point on those. So I probably think that it was um, part of a larger uh, project. It. It's her hanger. It's going to hang it. I don't know. I haven't had this one out in a long time either. I need to take leave this one out and enjoy it. So you can see that the inside here is about the size of my palm of my hand and these little pieces here. Um, I think they were maybe about one to one and a fourth inches. I think they were probably one and a fourth. 
So, uh, any last minute questions, Steve, before we get done? I really hope you enjoyed these um, approximately 35 quilts that were all miniatures. Um, you can get great ideas from these. You don't have to make them little. You can make them That's larger. That's what a lot of people commented. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great to see the whole quilt in that miniature size. And, you know, you can just make the blocks larger and make more blocks and, and get a larger one if the mini quilts are not your thing. But I think so many times people have maybe tried to make a miniature quilt and realized that smaller is not easier. Smaller is actually, it's, it's, you have this small section of quilts or pieces that are difficult, then you have a large category of medium size shapes that are very easy to do. And then even when you get to the larger quilts, the larger pieces, larger pieces actually fall into the same category as smaller pieces as being harder to do. So what that means is that if you have a human element, which is an error or a mistake, you know, a thread or two off is gonna make a big difference in a miniature quilt. And then in those bigger blocks and shapes, if you're off, those show up more because they're bigger uh, and not as always as easy to fit in if things are not the size or the shape that they should be. So it's actually this middle category of um, sizes of shapes and blocks that are actually the easiest to do. So this one right here is a, a three inch center square and a lot of times people will look at this and say, oh, that's too small to work with. This three inch up to about five inch center squares are the easiest shapes uh, and sizes to work with. So don't, um, don't shy away from a block that's small. Um, sit down and, and uh, try it and see what, what you can do. And of course, the square and square system helps eliminate the human element, helps improve on the cutting and the sewing and the pressing so that you get great shapes. We do all of this sewing here in the, the human element then we come in with the tool and trim it up. So it's uh, kind of like putting, you can you know, help improve on that human element because you're, you're cutting it last instead of cutting it first and the human trying to do all the work and then it, you got issues and then trying to fix it. So we, we have flipped it with the square and a square system so that the human does the work at the first and then you trim it last and you have a great shape. So remember the um, hotline, 817-713-2879. Send me your questions, show me your pictures. If you have issues, show me front and back. And we'll, um, we're able to help lots of people that way, all over the earth uh, with the internet. We can help anybody. And then and I'll, can the um, you can use the that. email, jody at square and square .com. Um, And I really implore you to investigate um, all the different things that we do from Premium Club to uh, these teachings that this year I'm, I'm doing once a month this uh, spring semester and then I'll do them once a month in the fall, and then I don't know yet for summer what I'm doing. But um, Get on our email list. Get on our email list. Go to our website. Get on our email list. That way you'll know when we have teachings and what's going on. Also, um, our retreat for this year is Mother's Day week. We're calling it our Mother's Day retreat. We have room for a couple more in there. Next year it will be April. I think it's the third week of April. And we're going to open sign-ups uh, for that um, fairly soon. And then our Quilt Club week is the first week of October. And of course, our Premium Club runs all year. The party never ends with Quilt Club week. It, I mean, with a Premium Club. Premium Club is all year long where we do teachings and um, lots of different fun projects and lots of learning. I, I love the statement, and I've gotten this multiple times over multiple years from, of course, multiple people. And they say, I've been sewing 30 years. I've been <laughs> sewing 40 years. I've been, is that one that's on there? Yeah. Uh, and uh, I have learned more in the nine months I've been with Jody. Wish or the I knew it 30 years yeah, ago. Yeah, uh, or I wished I knew about this 30 years ago. And so don't delay. Don't delay. Come and join us today <laughs> and improve on the skills. I always say become the piecer that you've always dreamed to be. And I think it's kind of funny because my little granddaughter that's now nine, she's been sewing since she was two in a few months and uh, she's just really turned into a wonderful little seamstress and quilter and she told me at Christmas when she was here she said Mimi I've decided that I am a topper that I like the piecing process more than I do the quilting now on the quilting she hasn't done any hand quilting and on the machine she's just done straight line quilting no designs or anything and I, I think when I get her this summer I'm going to introduce some uh, free motion quilting to her to see if she likes that she may want to finish her quilts that way I told her I said well you know Lydia 
If you want to be a topper, that's just fine. There's a lot of toppers out there in the world that just enjoy their piecing. And I don't think we have to get worried or caught up in, I need to finish all these quilts. If you're a topper and a piecer and that's what you enjoy, do it. You're doing it for your enjoyment. Hang them up in a little little closet somewhere on, on hangers. And uh, if someone needs a gift, then you can go get that one finished. Or you have a family member that falls in love with one, then you can go get that one quilted. But you don't have to get them all quilted. I, I'm not quilting all of mine anymore. I'm, I'm make, making my tops to teach and to demo and to showcase the fabric. And if it's one that someone wants or one that I want, then I'll get it quilted. But otherwise, I'm just going to have a stack of tops and somebody can figure out what to do with those later. I'm not I'm not going to worry about it. I enjoy the piecing. Um, I like to do some quilting, but I can't get them all um, myself and quilted. there's a lot of people that do like to quilt. And there's a lot of people that do like to quilt, and that's their income, so I'm going to let them do it. But I will also tell you that if you've been following me and you've seen these trunk show, you know I have hundreds and hundreds of quilts that I've made in my 60 plus years. And, um, you know, I, it takes more space to display a finished quilt or, you know, for all of these finished quilts. I mean, you can stand in my entryway. I think there's 114 quilts you can see just in my entryway. My entryway, and my dining room, and just a little dab of a hallway there. I have hundreds of quilts in my house and you you cut, you get to a storage issue after a while. And so not quilting them and just leaving them as tops helps, um, helps that with me. Also, if I decide to sell a quilt, which I have sold some and given a lot away over the years, um, then they can get it quilted however they want it quilted. So um, I guess that's it. Any last minute questions? I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry about the technical issue that we didn't get to do this yesterday on Sunday, but hopefully um, in an hour and 45 minutes you enjoyed it. And of course there's replays. Go and join our website and you can go in there and watch all the webinars from 2021 and these that we've been doing for 2022. Remember, we're here to teach you and help you, so don't hesitate to text or email if you have questions, and we'll be happy to help. We'll see you soon. Bye.